black pepper is one of the most common and widely used spices on earth to the point that you would probably have a hard time finding a household that doesn't have any. The chemical primarily responsible for black pepper's unique flavor and aroma is called piperine, and today I'm going to extract some directly from black pepper. To get started, I weigh out just about 43 grams of pre-ground black pepper and set it aside. Next I cram a cotton ball into the bottom of this piece of glassware called a sock slit extractor which I've never demonstrated before on this channel. Once the cotton is in place, I pour in my black pepper and then put another cotton ball on top. And these two cotton balls are basically taking the place of a piece of glassware called a thimble that's supposed to sit inside of the sock slit extractor. I go ahead and set this aside and then I pour 150 milliliters of isopropyl alcohol into a 500 milliliter boiling flask that's situated in my heating mantle. At this point, I just need to construct my extraction apparatus, and to do this, I simply connect my sock slit extractor to the boiling flask, and then I connect an Allen condenser above the sock slit extractor. Cold water is circulated through the Allen condenser, and I crank my heating mantle to 100 degrees Celsius. As the isopropyl evaporates, it travels up the leftmost arm of the sock slit extractor and back up into the condenser where it's immediately condensed back into a liquid and drips onto the black pepper. Over time, the solvent soaks through the pepper and pulls out the piperine along with several other secondary chemicals. As the volume of isopropyl in the sock slit extractor increases, it begins to travel up the secondary siphon arm, and this is where things start to get interesting. Here's a diagram of the sock slit extraction apparatus so you can better understand what I'm talking about. Basically the idea here is that when the solvent rises to the top of the bend in the secondary arm, it'll create a vacuum which will pull all of the isopropyl through the black pepper and back into the boiling flask. At that point, it will immediately start to evaporate again and condense clean isopropyl back on top of the black pepper. This builds until it triggers the siphon again and the process repeats, which makes this a continuous extraction technique. The cool thing about this process is that due to the fact that black pepper is being continuously rinsed with fresh isopropyl, you can achieve a nearly 100% efficient extraction with a relatively small amount of solvent. This process is also entirely feasible without an expensive sock slit extractor, and all you'd need to do is boil the black pepper in isopropyl for a while and then filter the black pepper out. The only real downside to a method like this is that it's going to be a lot more wasteful of solvent, which is only really a problem if you're using an expensive solvent or if you're doing extractions all the time. Otherwise, it's totally fine. Anyway, I go ahead and let this cycle run twice, and then just before the siphon triggers a third time, I remove the heating mantle, allow it to cool, and then trigger a third cycle by dripping a bit of isopropyl through the top of the condenser. I then set this up for a standard distillation to boil away as much of the excess isopropyl from my extract as possible. This is something you might typically do with a rotary evaporator if you are extremely wealthy and happen to have one. And it's also typically something you'd only do with an expensive solvent, not typically isopropyl. Once I collected about 100 milliliters of isopropyl, I cut the heating and set my flask aside to cool. While I'm waiting for it to cool down, I go ahead and dissolve 2 grams of potassium hydroxide in 20 milliliters of isopropyl. And this was a bit tougher than I expected, and I ended up having to heat it a bit on the hot plate to get it to dissolve completely. This alkaline isopropyl solution is then added to my extract, and the idea here is that the hydroxide should react with the majority of the non-piperine chemicals that were extracted. This will saponify most of the fats and oils present, while most of the secondary alkaloids present besides piperine should be made insoluble in isopropyl by the step. To that end, I stir this for a few minutes and then pass the solution through a cotton ball to remove all the crap that precipitated. This step ideally will leave me with a solution of now water-soluble plant oils and water-insoluble piperine. Now to actually separate out my piperine, all I need to do is very slowly add ice cold water to the solution. Immediately upon adding the water, white clouds of piperine form as it crashes out of solution. And this looks pretty cool, so I'm going to stop talking for a moment so you can watch it.
As you can see here, I keep adding water until the piperine stops crashing out, and then I pour this into a larger beaker and leave it overnight to allow as much piperine as possible to precipitate out. When I come back the next day, I pass the solution through vacuum filtration to collect my piperine. And even though it looks like a lot got through here, I thought a lot got through here as well and went out of my way to precipitate all the piperine in the filtrate, and it really didn't amount to much. It seems the particles that do get through are very, very tiny. With that said, this left me with a yellow slab of crude piperine, which I next added to a crystallization dish and dissolved in a minimal amount of hot isopropanol. I intended to let this cool down slowly so that crystals of piperine would form, but over an hour passed without any changes, so I got bored and left it overnight. When I came back, all of the isopropyl had evaporated and I was left with these crude and obviously very impure piperine crystals. These crystals felt resinous and kind of tacky, so I'm sure the primary contaminant was oil that had not fully saponified in the earlier step. But I go ahead and weigh this anyway, and I got a crude yield of 1.7 grams, or 3.95% of the initial mass of my black pepper. This is already a very low yield compared to what is supposed to be the piperine content of black pepper, and I blame the pre-ground stuff. Regardless, I then try to recrystallize this again in an even smaller amount of isopropyl, and this time I did actually get some recrystallization. You can see that absolutely pure piperine crystals are long, slender, and translucent, unlike the opaque short crystals I got earlier. Once I get bored of waiting for crystals to form, I go ahead and pass these through vacuum filtration and desiccated them under a vacuum for a few hours. I then weighed them and got a mass of 0.73 grams. According to the internet, black pepper is allegedly 5-10% to piperine by mass, and this is about 1.7% of my initial mass. So obviously some piperine was lost along the way, as I've never done this before, and a lot of product is always lost in trial and error. With that said, I think I could very reasonably double this number with another attempt, but that still doesn't reach the minimum percentage found in black peppercorns, so I'm going to assume here that the mass of piperine in pre-ground black pepper must be lower than in fresh peppercorns. Obviously though, this is an assumption, and I'd still need to test it to be sure, but regardless, I'm generally happy with how this went. I really want to get some more use out of this oxalate extractor, so let me know in the comments what you'd like to see me try and extract next. However, there's more you can do with a oxalate extractor than, you know, extractions. This does require you to get a little creative though, and one thing I discovered on my own that definitely already has been discovered somewhere in the world is using this for esterification reactions. Specifically, I have a few videos coming up where I filled my soxalate extractor with desiccant beads and then performed an esterification while refluxing through the soxalate extractor. This effectively removed water from the reaction mixture and supplanted the use of a Dean Stark trap, which I'm far too cheap to buy. In any case, with that side note out of the way, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you'd like to see more like it, consider following me here on YouTube, TikTok, or by becoming a patron. And speaking of patrons, a big thanks as always goes out to my patrons whose generous contributions help fund these projects and allow me to keep this channel going. Keep the requests coming, and I'll see you all next time.